started. Uh, thank you very much for coming out tonight. My name is Carol Kowalski. I'm the Assistant Town Manager for Development. I'm the Department Head for Land Use, Health, and Development. And tonight is the Existing Conditions and Trends presentation on open space, natural resources, and recreation. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the chair of the uh, Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee, Sarah Felton, is here. She's one of the two co-chairs. Our planning director, Amanda Loomis, is new as of January, so why don't you wave your hand so people can get introduced to you. Molly Belander is our planner next to her. We also have members of the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee. Pema Bot, would you mind raising your hand? And Marilyn Penalosa and Len Morsportier. I don't believe I've overlooked anyone on the committee. Uh, I also want to um, acknowledge Bill Hamilton, the chair of the Conservation Commission, and um, a member of the Recreation Commission. I'm Lisa sorry. Rose. Lisa Rose. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to give a little uh, review of where we are with comprehensive plan update. Lexington's last comprehensive plan was completed in 2003. George W. Bush was in his first term of office, and the iPhone was still four years away. So it's really important that we update the comprehensive plan. We need to consider trends and needs in Lexington for the next 10 to 20 years, and how our land and physical policies uh, will, physical development policies, will help to address Lexington's future needs. To date, we, we, we launched this uh, with some education panels in 2018 on Lexington's housing, economic development, and transportation, followed by an online survey. In 2018, we had three World Cafe community conversations uh, where Lexington residents had an opportunity to express what, what we value, what's missing, and areas that Lexington um, has made, in which Lexington has made progress since the last comprehensive plan, and areas that should be a high priority in the plan update. So far, we've had presentations on Lexington's demographic trend and housing needs in March of 2019. We've had trends and conditions in economic development and transportation presented in April of 2019. Historic resources were presented in September of 2019. And after tonight's presentation, we'll have a facilities presentation in April. There will then be additional community input opportunities as the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee will determine the priority issues and goals and recommendations for the plan with the intention of a first draft in December of this year. So tonight we're pleased to have uh, uh, Lexington resident Alex Johan, who is a member of the Conservation Commission and who is the Education uh, Department Program Coordinator for Massachusetts Audubon Society. We also have Charlie Wyman with us, who is a member of the Sustainable Lexington and serves on the Conservation Commission's Land Acquisition Subcommittee. They will be, looking, if they, if they will be available for questions and to elaborate on any major trends and issues that are presented tonight. So the presenters are our Recreation Director, Melissa Batiste, Assistant Recreation Director, Peter Coleman, our, our um, Conservation Stewardship Coordinator, Jordan McCarran, and our Conservation Director, Karen Mullins. So we'll hear from uh, the uh, Conservation first, is that right? Okay, thank you. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers later, so thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Carol, and thank you all for coming this evening um, to learn and share your thoughts um, about the town's conservation and recreation um, pro properties and programs in preparation of the next comprehensive plan here in Lexington. Our plan for this evening is to provide a snapshot of the town's existing conservation and recreation resources and programs, identify challenges and opportunities, identify current trends and sustainability, and to pro provide a list of references and resources that you can refer to in greater detail after this evening if you would like to find out more. 
Finally, we want to hear from you on the earth. Any questions and thoughts with regards to challenges, opportunities, trends, and sustainability for further consideration? Since you'll be hearing the word open space a lot this evening, I thought the first thing to do was to define what open space is for you. So here in Lexington, we define open space as undeveloped land designated for recreation, agriculture, and the protection of historic, cultural, and natural resources. Now, it's my understanding um, in previous presentations you've heard on historic and cultural resources. So tonight, we're going to concentrate on conservation and recreation programming and parcels. So for those who are not aware, um, the state requires that towns have a comprehensive plan for open space and recreation. Um, and so Lexington has had that since 2015. That was the last time it was updated. And it's a seven-year plan. It uh, has a seven-year action plan. And that is good until 2022. And then we're going to be going into uh, looking to provide an update on that. Um, in the current plan, um, it focused on enhancements, maintenance, management, protection, acquisition, and stewardship. And we're hoping that um, several of you will help participate in that and starting in 2022 to update that and share your thoughts for a plan. That plan um, it will be kind of part of the comprehensive plan, is my understanding. Instead of going through it again, we'll just use that as, as a majority of considerations for it. Now let's get down to the designation and breakdown of open space in Lexington. <laughs> That's okay, thanks Jordan. Feel free to keep doing that if you want. <laughs> so um, you'll notice on the, the map here, the lighter shades of green, those are conservation land here in town, and those are considered permanently protected properties here. Um, they're protected by Article 97. Um, to take that out of conservation land requires um, an act of the state legislature. And then if we go to the red parcels you'll see on this map, those are recreation and school properties. And I believe um, Peter will be talking about those shortly regarding existing conditions for those facilities. And I forgot to mention Jordan will talk about existing conditions on the conservation parcels. The pink parcels you see on this plan are municipal properties. And starting from the west, we have Westview Cemetery, we have the compost facility, working towards the center off Mass Ave, we have Tower Park, and then up off um, in the north northeastern section, we have Ash Hill Young Street parcel, which abuts uh, Lower Vinebrook Conservation Area. The gold on this map are, uh, are other municipal land owned by other municipalities, and so you'll, you'll notice in the southwest part of town, that's the city of Cambridge water supply property. And then up on the eastern border, we have the Arlington Great Meadow property and the Arlington Reservoir property. And then the purple properties are the state land within town, and that's um, managed by the Division of Conservation and Recreation, and that's the Beaverbrook North Reservation. And then the darker green in the western part is the Minuteman National Park Federal property. In addition to government open space, we also have private. We own pri privately owned open space in town. And those, um, the three I w just want to highlight is the Lexington Golf Club. That's a, a recreational facility. We have the Belmont Country Club, another um, recreational facility. And then we have Swam and Land, which is a large wetland area in the southern part of town. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jordan McCarran, and he's going to talk about conservation lands existing conditions. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> I'll get a little closer. Um, my role here primarily is the uh, management and stewardship of the town's conservation land, so I'm intimately familiar with it, uh, although I'm still going to look at my notes here um, to make sure I get it right. Um, Lexington is very fortunate, thanks, 
um, to have uh, just over 1,300 acres of land permanently protected, as Karen said, by Article 97 of the state constitution as conservation land. Um, you're familiar with, with most of this land um, because for the most part it's divided into 27 main properties that we've designated with names, names that you're familiar with, um, like Willers Woods, like Whipple Hill, like Lower Vinebrook, Meagerville, um, Katahdin Woods. There are, uh, I, I would say, um, a number of other smaller parcels that are uh, uh, not necessarily contiguous with these larger parcels that are owned by the town that we also manage that are either predominantly wet or without trails, um, forested areas, um, not necessarily areas that we invite public access or that we have the facilities or the infrastructure um, for public access. But the bulk of our attention, our projects, um, um, the places that we look for opportunities to um, invite the public on to the land to learn and to engage with nature are on these, these 27 main areas. Um, so uh, we also are very fortunate to have, um, it's actually over 50 miles of trail in Lexington if you were to hike um, each, each mile individually. And um, that's an amazing resource. Um, a, the, not the bulk, but a big part of our department's uh, role in Lexington is to maintain this trail system and improve it. And I'll talk a little bit later in the presentation about some of the um, universal access, universally accessible improvements that we're trying to make um, to uh, ensure that uh, people of all abilities um, um, can enjoy our open space. Thanks, Karen. So um, all this conservation land um, constitutes roughly 12% of Lexington's land base, and it's uh, hyperbolic in a way to say, but it's, it's um, for a uh, town this close to Boston, it's an unbelievable amount of land that's been preserved in Lexington um, for our enjoyment. Um, we've, we've also been throwing around this number 20%. And when you consider all open space in Lexington, including uh, the lands that are designated for agriculture, um, recreation, the historic areas like the Battle Green, Hastings Park, um, other uh, open space in town that's um, you know uh, managed like conservation land but not by our department like Lincoln Park, for example, when you take all that into account, we have more like 20%. Um, and that's incredible. That's a great resource. Thanks. So just a, f a few um, comments on um, <clears throat> what conservation land provides for, uh, for our community. And we're gonna speak in a little bit more detail both in this presentation and after when we have some discussion and we have some experts in the audience that can speak in more detail about, about, these, um, about these ideas. But conservation land um, primarily provides core habitat and refuge for wildlife. That's a huge component of why we preserve the land. And um, there are a number of larger parcels in Lexington that have what we call core habitat. In other words, there's enough acreage um, and there's enough either forested area or wetland area to um, serve as actual important habitat for wildlife. Public health um, benefit through air and water quality as well. Um, wetlands obviously are hugely important for protecting our groundwater, our drinking water, and we'll speak more in more detail about what our department does to ensure that protection later in the presentation. Um, and then um, air quality is enhanced and protected because trees take in carbon dioxide and, and give us oxygen, um, and at the same time um, give us some air purification as well. Climate change mitigation, that's a huge uh, topic and a huge focus I know of the town of Lexington and of our department as well. And, and because we have, uh, because we manage all this open space in town, we are ideally suited to, um, to kind of drive this and, and be influential in um, uh, moving forward climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies in Lexington. Um, both through carbon sequestration, uh, uh, most of our uh, parcels, as I said, are, are forested. I mean, even the wet parcels um, do provide some carbon sequestration and flood storage as well. Water in Lexington needs somewhere to go and, and a lot of our open space can serve that purpose. And then um, last but definitely not least, our land provides a ton of uh, both recreational and educational opportunities in Lexington. In, on the conservation side, we focus on passive recreation and we partner a little with the recreation department. They're more focused on active recreation, which they'll talk about. 
but there's a lot of opportunity to get people out on the land, to recreate, to enjoy nature, um, to um, sort of embody a healthy lifestyle, um, as well as educational opportunities associated with that. Okay, and some agric agricultural opportunities as well. On town conservation land, we have some acreage that we license for agriculture, uh, most notably on Waltham Street, uh, what we call the Waltham Street Fields. But we also run a, a very active community garden program. We license beekeeping uh, as well as um, some amount of goat grazing on town land as well. Um, and uh, there's opportunities to uh, enhance that or um, enlarge that, that presence on, on town land moving into the future. And as we think about open space and natural resources, I wanted to bring to your attention, here in Lexington, we have 20 named streams in town, along with all their associated wetlands. And then from that, we um, those fall within one of three watersheds. And so looking at this map, the, the green area is the Shawshine River watershed. The pink area is the Mystic River watershed, and the yellow area is the Charles River watershed. And Lexington is unique because all streams um, start in Lexington and head out, um, and um, so that's unique. So what that means is water falling in Lexington runs off to other communities, so we are responsible for our water quality and our water resources here in town. I'm going to give a, a brief update on the work that our department has done uh, in regards to the open space and recreation plan that Karen mentioned before that was updated in 2015. And what came out of that uh, was a seven-year action plan with nine goals and associated um, objectives. Um, and that's really what's driven the, the kind of project work that we that our department has done since 2015. And, and we're still working on, on these um, goals currently. Um, the first I'll mention is our conservation meadow preservation program. Since 2015, we've done enhancements to push back encroachment on field edges, uh, restore stone walls, vistas from roadsides, um, and enhance the habitat of our, our conservation meadows. At Hennessy Field, which is at the end of Robinson Road adjacent to Estabrook Elementary School and is part of our paint mine conservation area. At Joyce Miller's Meadow, which is a town-owned parcel that's adjacent to the Arlington Grape Meadow. Um, it's mostly accessible from the bikeway. Um, and we are currently working um, at Wright Farm to do the same. Um, and we have a, uh, an article before town meeting through the CPA um, for meadow enhancements at Daisy Wilson Meadow um, this coming year. So in 2017, we resurfaced the recreational trail at Lower Vinebrook, that paved trail that connects North Street with um, Fairfield Drive, sorry, I was blanking on the how far it goes, and that was a, a direct, uh, that was a, an objective that came out of the um, uh, open space and rec plan from 2015. Another uh, uh, big focus of our department, and it's a it's a state mandate, but it's it's also very important to the town of Lexington and our department is creating more universally accessible opportunities for folks to uh, engage with conservation land in Lexington. We are just now completing um, uh, accessible trail upgrades and parking upgrades um, at Cotton Farm. And in fact, if you go to Cotton Farm now, although there's some planting left to be done and some minor drainage work left to be done that the uh, contractor will do in the spring, you can still access the handicap accessible um, parking area. There's a couple trails now that are universally accessible. There's a new platform right on the pond at, at Cotton Farm. And there's a, a beautiful apple orchard there that we manage and, um, and hopefully will be productive this year. So there's a lot of nice amenities there that are open to the public um, that we're very proud of. We're also now in the process of doing something similar at Parker Meadow. Um, in fact, this week the commission uh, voted on a preferred concept design for universally accessible upgrades to Parker Meadow. And the next step will be design and permitting and then and construction will follow. And we hope to continue um, with those types of upgrades to our trail infrastructure and um, enabling uh, people of all abilities to um, enjoy our conservation land. 
We've um, received a number of grants um, over, the, over the past few years, and since 2014, 2015, we've done a number of uh, long, large, larger scale boardwalk improvements at Whipple Hill, um, as well as Hayden Woods Conservation Area through grants that we received from the state's Recreational Trails Program. This is a, a grant program run by the Division of Conservation and Recreation that utilizes state money as well as federal money um, to uh, allow communities to make um, improvements to their trail connectivity and their trail accessibility. Um, one thing I'll say about these is these grants typically are matching grants. And we, as, you, as some of you may know, are very fortunate to have a very active volunteer program in Lexington called the Lexington Conservation Stewards, which is part of my role is to uh, facilitate that program. And these matching grants allow you to monetize volunteer time in order to make the match. Um, and so we've done that at Whipple Hill and at Hayden Woods with a number of uh, different groups from the community, individual volunteers, and a lot of help from our uh, scouting program in Lexington as well, which we're very fortunate to have. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is um, it's a, uh, not only a, a big um, priority of the Conservation Commission, but something that came directly out of the Open Space and Rec Plan is to focus on land management. So a lot of the projects that we do now come out of or are um, uh, goals that come out of extensive ecological land management planning that we do, um, both with the commission and staff and in engaging the community um, to get a better understanding of what we should do with the land and how we manage it into the future. Thank you. Do you want me to slide this over so you can run the... Thanks, Jordan. Uh, before we give you some updates on the accomplishments of our department over the past five years, I do just want to give you um, an overview of our department. So the town's recreation infrastructure does consist of 429 acres of land and open space, and that uh, is constituted of over 30 athletic fields, 11 neighborhood parks and play areas, including the Center Recreation Complex and Lincoln Park, uh, eight basketball courts, 17 tennis courts, uh, two outdoor aquatic facilities, the Irving H. Maybe Town Pool Complex and the Old Reservoir, and the Pine Meadows Golf Club. Um, so certainly it's been a very exciting time for our department these past five years, starting with the opening of Lexington Community Center back in July of 2015. So uh, certainly the response from the community has exceeded all of our expectations. So just some um, measures as far as what we've been keeping track of. Right now, the community center is open six days a week, uh, Monday through Saturday, uh, for a total of 73 hours each week. Uh, we've offered 1,300 programs at the facility while we've been open. Uh, we do have over 11,400 members at the community center. Uh, we've had over 24,000 room reservations at the facility, and we've had in excess of 445,000 unique visits at the facility. So once again, we're averaging right around 100,000 visits um, from individuals and patrons each year. So it's been just a huge, huge success uh, for the entire community. The uh, second update is just regarding our ADA compliance study. So this study was completed back in 2017, and a total of 21 parks and recreation facilities were included in the study. Uh, the recommendations that were made in this study have been implemented in our current capital projects and will be incorporated in our future capital projects going forward. Um, as a staff, we did meet with the Commission on Disability once we had this study, and the top three priorities that they highlighted were accessibility at the Old Reservoir, the Pine Meadows Clubhouse, and neighborhood parks and play areas. So through our you know, plans, we have the Old Reservoir facility that's going to be renovated this season. Uh, Pine Meadows, the clubhouse, we're looking to um, do design and engineering work this year followed by construction um, in FY22. And then our neighborhood parks and play areas are things that we certainly look to update uh, throughout our five-year capital plan. We do also conduct a series of improvements at Pine Meadows, uh, just two that we've had these last five years. Back in 2017, we renovated the fourth green. And then this past year in 2019, we reconstructed bunkers on the sixth and seventh green converted a sand bunker into a grass hollow on the fifth hole, and we renovated the tee box on the sixth hole, and certainly made upgrades to a variety of cart paths throughout the entire facility. Uh, another development that we're very pleased to announce is the addition of a certified therapeutic recreation specialist to our staff 
in 2019. Uh, Kate DeAngelis joined our staff back in February of last year, and her primary responsibility is to create and deliver inclusive and adaptive programming uh, to, throughout the entire community. Um, we have heard nothing but rave reviews and positive feedback, both for Kate and her inclusion specialists. Uh, so it certainly um, has been a tremendous addition to our department. Currently, the position is part-time, but we will be going to town meeting this spring, requesting that that uh, position goes from part-time to full-time beginning July 1st. And lastly on this slide, uh, we certainly have tried to enhance our presence on social media, whether it be on Facebook or on Instagram. Certainly we have a lot of younger families with young children, so uh, while we may be accustomed to our traditional program brochure, uh, we certainly need to pursue other avenues of how to reach out to those families. Um, so we have certainly have a, a young and energetic staff that tries to uh, connect in those regards, and we've tried to modernize our town website through our announcements and just try to have as much information as we can on that as well. We have redesigned our program brochures. You may have noticed the summer camp brochure that came out recently had a new, fresh look to it. So once again, we're just trying to make it eye appealing and attractive for all of our users. And one thing to highlight is our Play Local system. So we implemented this back in 2018. It is an online tennis court reservation system. It serves both tennis courts and pickleball. So you can make a reservation from the comfort of your home when you're away on business uh, for up to two weeks in advance. So previously, prior to this system being implemented, you had to reserve your courts in person, whether it be at our old office in Town Hall, whether it be at the community center, or you may know the tennis booth, which used to be part of the town pool complex, which certainly was not the most convenient to our tennis community. So we uh, have um, made that accommodation, and usage has in increased significantly. Uh, last year in FY19, we had over 21,000 hours permitted on our tennis courts throughout town. So over the 17 courts, that's a high usage um, by the tennis community. We, as I mentioned earlier, we do a variety of replacements uh, at our parks and playgrounds. Back in 2016, we did uh, install a new playground at Marvin Park. Up at Lincoln Park, uh, we have replaced the synthetic turf fields on all three fields here these last five years. Field one and field two were replaced in 2015, and field three was replaced in 2016. And lastly, we've made a series of improvements at the Center Recreation Complex. The uh, Irving H. Maybe Town Pool Complex, um, those renovations were completed in 2018. You'll see a picture on the screen there. Uh, a completely reconfigured new splash pad with a zero depth entry for our youngest participants. Uh, we had brand new filtration systems installed, and we also had a new customer service window, uh, once again, to try to be more accommodating to our patrons and our participants to allow program registration of any kind while at the pool facility. And then last year, we did complete um, some lighting upgrades at the facility on the Center 1 baseball field and Center 2 softball field. We will be going back to town meeting this spring uh, for additional funding requests for the pool complex, for the basketball courts, and the Gallagher tennis courts. And I do want to highlight that currently only four of the courts are lit, but with these uh, proposed improvements, we would be lighting all ten of the courts going forward. As we think about the development of the next Lexington Conservation, Lexington Comprehensive Plan and the next update to the Open Space and Recreation Plan, um, here's what we offer for challenges and opportunities for conservation for consideration. First one is acquiring parcels of conservation interest. Due to high land values and limited buildable land, there's a tremendous competition between development and protecting conservation interests. Next one is providing access to open space. Balance of providing visitor use with environmental resource protection and natural and scenic um, aesthetics, kind of maintaining that. The next one is balancing environmental protection and development. Again, maximizing economic opportunities for increased revenue to the town while continuing to protect natural resources in the town. Next one is climate change mitigation. Opportunities to mitigate impacts of climate change through carbon sequestration and flood control. But at the same time, this is a challenge, there's a challenge of protection versus use compatibility, such as tree protection versus solar energy systems or, um, or flood control and, and storage. 
Next one is financial and staffing constraints, being able to sustain regulatory functions along with land management planning and implement implementation in light of competing interests for town revenues along with limited staffing and volunteer resources. And the final one is in community engagement and conservation projects. Now Jordan's going to speak to the current trends. Thanks, Karen. Um, many of these trends are related to the challenges and opportunities that Karen um, just uh, reviewed, which makes sense. And Karen and I are gonna trade off on going into more depth on each of these trends in the subsequent slides. So I'll read them off um, just so you know the, the trends that we see. And obviously after the presentation, we're interested to hear from you um, to learn about anything that we missed, um, particularly as it uh, relates to opportunities that are out there that we're not uh, identifying or not seeing. So the first trend we're seeing, um, and this is definitely true in Lexington, is creative land protection projects. Um, for example, like partnering with LexHab um, and private development to accomplish open space preservation. Karen's gonna talk a little bit more, more about that um, after this slide. Greater connectivity and access between open space parcels and neighborhoods. Um, the across Lexington system being the primary example of, in Lexington of how we're accomplishing this. And I'll speak in a little more detail about that, that project and that system. Ecological land management planning and implementation. Um, again, land management planning is one of the commission's top priorities. And if you look at the sort of trend or the, um, the way that uh, municipalities have acquired land over the past several decades, at first the focus was on acquiring the land and because it was thought to be conservation land, it should remain natural and, and little intervention was needed. And now we're learning that there are a lot of issues like invasive plant management, native habitat restoration, um, providing the right type of access that we need to address and deal with. So we're shifting our focus now toward managing the parcels that we have and planning is a huge piece of that. Um, and then stronger environmental regulation. Um, and Karen's gonna speak in more depth about that as well. Before I move on, I'll just s uh, speak briefly to the ecological land management planning and implementation um, <clears throat> and just provide two examples of how our department has used that process effectively. The first I mentioned, we made accessible upgrades to Cotton Farm um, and they're just about complete. And that came directly out of land management planning that we did in 2015 with the help of Mass Audubon to identify long-term and short-term goals for the property. And one of the key long-term goals was looking at what Cotton Farm had to offer, an apple orchard, an existing parking area, proximity to the community center um, with some potential future connectivity options. And so it made sense to, if we were gonna try out a, a fully accessible trail system, that that might be an ideal property. And so uh, the initial planning for that took place within the context of this land management planning process and that was hugely helpful for us. The other one I'll mention briefly is at Wright Farm. Um, we also had land management planning done through Mass Audubon. And um, in, the, in the process of their staff uh, visiting the property and getting to know it, they identified um, a invasive plant called Japanese stiltgrass that is what we uh, define as an early detection rapid response species. In other words, unlike um, oriental bittersweet, which uh, you all are probably very familiar with, or garlic mustard, which is ubiquitous and everywhere um, and very hard to manage on, the, on a large scale, something like Japanese stiltgrass is an invasive plant by definition, but its distribution is very limited in the state. And in fact, um, at Wright Farm is the only location we know of that it occurs in Lexington. So the idea is to put a lot of resources into trying to eradicate that specific population before it turns into something like garlic mustard or um, Asiatic bittersweet. And so we, through that land management planning, we were able to identify that species existed there, prioritize its eradication. And now um, I would say four years in, it's not eradicated, but we have a good control over it. And we're now uh, more in the process of monitoring on an annual basis other than going in and really trying to um, eradicate and pull it, which we did for multiple years. So that's a successful outcome of this land management planning process that we've been prioritizing. Um, all right, Great. so I'll leave it to you. Great, <laughs> so, um, so speaking to back to the trend of land protection and finding creative land 
land protection um, opportunities. Um, we look back to when the Community Preservation Act was adopted, um, and, in, um, and the commission has, since its adoption, has acquired 56.61 acres here in town, and that it was through the purchase of the Wright Farm back in, beginning in 2012 and then 2015, and that was for a total of 13.4 13 acres. And that was a creative land protection acquisition with a partnership with Lexhab. Lexhab became the owner of the single family house residence for affordable housing. And then the commission will now will have the conservation land to offer programming and, and such for the community. Then um, in 2011, they acquired Cotton Farm, which is 4.2 acres, and that expanded the upper Vineberg conservation area and was a key connection be between the community center parcel and out towards um, Worthen Road. <clears throat> and that um, was actually nice in that we were awarded the local acquisitions for natural diversity, which is called the land grant through the state, and that was the former self-help. Some of you may have known it as the self-help grant. And so that helped support some of the purchase price. And then the town also, as part of this acquisition, received as a gift the, the lot off Hartwell Ave to the front of the compost facility. And that's under municipal um, open space right now. And then in the other parcel we acquired was in 2009, 13.5 acres, known as the Larry property. And this was another example of a creative partnership with Lexhab. They are now own a single family house lot um, and we have the remainder of the land as conservation land that connects into the lower Vineberg conservation area. And then we acquired two Goodwin parcels. One of them expanded Meagerville by 9.5 acres. And then the other one expanded Katahdin Woods by 10.7 acres. And then recently, uh, uh, in the fall of 2019, we acquired um, a parcel off the end of Sherburn Road South, which expanded the upper Weinberg parcel by 4.8 acres. And also as part of that, we acquired a small parcel on K Kendall Road abutting the Weinberg, which was about 0.51 acres, but it, it helped protect a, a residential lot from development that had key wetland resource areas on it. And then we also have some other creative acquisitions um, through la generous land donations. Um, in the last several years, we've had a donation by David and Harriet Kaufman, which expanded the Turning Mill Pond Conservation Area by um, 2.88 acres. And then we also had a generous uh, donation by the Burns family, which expanded the Lower Weinberg Conservation Area by 4.63 acres in 2018. And this uh, um, acquisition also protected two key vernal pools um, in its associated upland buffer. And then some other opportunities where we acquire land is through um, rezoning and public benefit projects. Um, the most recent um, rezoning projects ended up with uh, conservation restrictions at no cost to the town. Um, one of the most recent ones was the former Shire property, which is now called Takeda. And we, um, we received a 36.2 acre conservation restriction, as well as a trail easement out to Spring Street. And then the other recent one is the 45 through 65 Hayden Ave project. They expanded their existing conservation restriction out to Hayden Ave by about two and a half acres and also granted public access. So we'll be able to access Hayden Woods from Hayden Avenue. And um, Jordan's gonna now talk about the across Lexington and connectivity trend. So on the lines of the trend toward greater connectivity and, and uh, access to our open space, I'm gonna talk briefly about the Across Lexington system, which is the, the best example we have in Lexington of, of this trend. There are several folks here tonight, including Mike Tabazinski and Alex Doan in the front row, that are on the Greenway Corridor Committee, which is an appointed committee by the Board of Selectmen to uh, look at and develop ways of connecting um, 
Lexington to it <laughs> to itself, I guess, um, through a series of trails. Um, so across. Um, just so everyone knows, it's an acronym that stands for Accessing Conservation Land, Recreation Areas, Open Space, Schools, and Streets. Um, <clears throat> it's, again, it's a project of the Greenway Corridor Committee. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, so this might be uh, very much review, but there are a lot of signed routes now out, um, on, uh, out on town land and, and in neighborhoods, on schools as well. Um, the committee has, I think, 10 signed routes currently with more in the works with about 35 miles or so of um, walking path or walking loops that you can um, enjoy and experience. And the real goal is to be able to connect the town center, and this is sort of a crossover with tourism and, and getting people that come in to visit the battle green and the historic sites in the center out into the community and enjoy our open spaces. But the, uh, one of the goals is to connect the town center um, out into the community to our athletic fields and recreational facilities and open space as well. And this is a, just a brief map. This is not totally up to date. There are uh, two other uh, newer routes that uh, we just weren't able to get the data uh, for in time for this presentation. But as you can see, there's a, a huge distribution of these marked trails in Lexington, which is um, a really a, a great um, accomplishment and a, a great resource for Lexington. So now speaking um, to the trend of stronger regulations for open space and natural resource protection, I first want to bring up the tree bylaw, also known as Chapter 120. Um, the town adopted this in 2001 um, and adopted a, um, and then a tree committee was established at an, later on in 2001. <clears throat> and Basically, um, what this does is increase the protection of the Lexington's tree canopy. And the benefits of this is enhancing aesthetic value in the town, providing resources and habitats for wildlife, and mitigating ad adverse effects of climate change. And um, in 2009, the committee put together a tree management manual, and that is a practical guide to tree planting and care and um, it's included in a reference, so if you want to know more information, you can seek out the manual. And then the next um, regulation I want to talk about is wetlands protection. You know, we talked about water resources in town, and um, one of the key ways um, for protecting those water resources is through the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, that was first established in Massachusetts in 1972 through the passing of the Wetlands Protection Act, and then also Lexington adopted a local um, Lexington Wetland General Bylaw. And this act and um, in bylaw <coughs> basically um, gave the authority to the conservation commissions to protect these er areas. <coughs> and in their regulatory role, conservation commissions are not actually protecting the wetlands, they protect the interests they serve. And um, this includes wildlife habitat, plant habitat, water supply and water quality, flood control, recreation values, and storm damage and pollution prevention. And then just um, one last other um, regulation has to do with stormwater management. And in 2008, the town adopted a stormwater management bylaw, and this um, further protected um, our water resources in town by preventing pollutants, trying to mitigate pollutants reaching streams. Lexington is an urbanized, water, has urbanized watersheds because um, all the stormwater runoff enters the catch basins and enters the drain pipes that outlets to streams and wetlands. And so the goal is to try to keep out pollutants out of those systems through stormwater management. And in town, engineering is the uh, kind of the day-to-day -day authority who oversees the federal general permits and the local permits. Um, and conservation manages stormwater through the Wetlands Protection Act when it's in their jurisdiction and um, conservation and engineering partner on how to best um, improve water quality and water protection within the town.
So we're going to highlight some of the challenges that we've encountered as a department recently. Uh, first and foremost is the lack of multi-use spaces, both indoor and outdoor spaces. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have a very active uh, both youth sports and adult sports organizations uh, throughout the town. So as a department, we do permit over 50,000 hours on our athletic fields each year. With that being said, uh, we do deny approximately 2,500 hours as well. Um, we have approximately 1,500 participants in Lexington United Soccer Club each season, uh, anywhere of close to 1,000 participants in Lexington Little League, and over 500 participants in Lexington Youth Lacrosse. So those are just the three you know, primary youth groups. There's others as well, um, including um, Lexington and Babe Ruth, among others. And then when you factor in all the adult organizations on top of that, um, once again, we have 30 fields, but uh, right now the demand currently exceeds the supply that we do have. Um, also, the access to gymnasiums. Obviously, they are used heavily, especially during the wintertime when it's basketball and wrestling season. So the uh, school gyms are used, obviously, by the Lexington Public Schools, by our department, and by the Lexington Youth Basketball Association, which is also known as LYBA, Travel Basketball. Um, given the crunch that LYBA is facing, given that the schools and our department have programs as well, they actually have to rent uh, gymnasium space outside of Lexington to be able to conduct all of their practices and games. So certainly that is not convenient given that that organization has, I would think it's between two and 300 participants each season as well. Um, second point is limited access to school facilities. Understandably, obviously during the school day, uh, we cannot run any of our programs in the school. Um, the community center has one uh, dance room on the bottom floor that we run the majority of our exercise classes in. Um, if you've ever been to the community center, you'll see that that room is booked from pretty much 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. when we open. But without having a larger room, uh, gym-like room, uh, that does restrict the types and amount of programs that we can offer during the school day. Um, regarding the infrastructure as it uh, pertains to school construction, with the construction of the Esterbrook School and most recently the new Hastings School, what has happened is the new school has been built on the current athletic field, and then once the new school building is complete, they rebuild the athletic field where the old school was. So with Hastings just opening, just to give you an idea, that field actually went offline back in June of 2018. And at this point, we anticipate that the Little League field that was there uh, will be rebuilt and reopened June of 2021. So for once again, for three years, that one field was uh, unusable by, for any of our programs or primarily the school and Lexington Little League as well. So whenever there is a school project, it's a little bit of a juggling act that we just need to take into account during that time frame. I did also mention earlier about field space and then growing, uh, given the growing popularity in pickleball, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, the 17 tennis courts um, are used actively by both tennis players and pickleball players alike. So trying to meet the needs of both of our user groups ha has been a little bit of a challenge. The next point, I think we can all acknowledge that the demographics are changing rapidly throughout the town, and it's certainly important for us as a staff to stay current, to make sure that we're providing uh, program opportunities that are appealing uh, and beneficial to all Lexington residents. And lastly, we have noticed in recent years um, a rise in our youth participation, as well as our age 60 plus programs. Uh, we have a lot of active adults um, and uh, 60 plus participants uh, throughout the community. So once again, trying to come up with programs and activities that meet their needs has been something that uh, we've certainly enjoyed trying to meet that challenge here recently. Just to touch on a few of our um, collaborations, we have collaborated with the Conservation Department since 2017 regarding the registration for the community gardens in town. Uh, so that's something I've worked directly with Jordan on over these past three years and we'll be doing it uh, again this summer. Um, we also have uh, partnered, as Jordan mentioned, with on the Across Lexington. We certainly have that information on our website and try to promote that uh, to anyone that comes to the community center. And we've had some special events as well. Uh, back in 2017, I know that um, we had a staff person work with Jordan for, on an apple picking event at Cotton Farm, which I believe a couple hundred people attended that event. Uh, so that was re very well received. And as Jordan highlighted earlier, we do partner with conservation on any Eagle Scout service projects. So if there's a potential Eagle Scout that approaches our department, um, whether it be something at the community center, something outside um, at a park, a playground, a field, we certainly try to uh, help steer that uh, candidate in the right direction. If it is on conservation land, then certainly Jordan works primarily with that individual. And we do also partner with the other community stakeholder groups in town, whether it be the Hayden Recreation Center, Cary Library, 
Monroe Center for the Arts, or the Special Needs Art Program, also known as SNAP. The picture you see there was actually of our first annual open house. We hold that at the community center each year um, in January. Uh, we started it back in 2018, and it provides a chance for these community user group, uh, community groups to um, display their program offerings and activities that they have throughout the community, and also advertise for any potential jobs or volunteer opportunities that they have available. So typically we have a few hundred people attend each of these events uh, each January. Thank you, Peter. Um, I also wanted to recognize our chair of the Rec Committee, Rick DeAngelis, who joined us um, once we started our presentation. Thanks for coming, Rick. Um, I'm going to share a little bit tonight about the trends in sustainability for recreation. Um, just as an overview, the Recreation Department functions as an enterprise fund, which means that we're self-supporting, with the exception of um, the salaries for three of our staff mem members at the community center. The department is, um, Ch challenged and charged with uh, recovering all of our expenses. So we have fees that are associated with what we, um, what we offer. But with that, we want to remain affordable and accessible um, at the same time, which can be a challenge when we have rising costs and expenses and different things that impact how we set our fees, but we also want to make sure that we are be being market analysis and thoughtful for what we are pricing our um, programs and services for and so we also look a lot of times for partnerships and for grants and for donations and, and things like that so um, one of the there's a lot of things that we've talked about tonight and then I, we're going to talk about how we are addressing some of that as we move forward the ADA um, compliance study that we did in 2017 was one of the tools that we're using to do that we are just now kicking off our community needs assessment uh, I did we did leave a flyer out on the um, snack table if you'd like to grab one but we're having our first community forum public forum next Wednesday evening March 4th um, and the goal of the community needs assessment is to really help us determine how to balance the the needs and the wants of the community members while we're keeping current with our trends as well as the rising changes in the needs and wants of the, the community so what this will do is it will be um, a largely uh, community uh, engaged process with stakeholders through a variety of focus groups and public meetings um, it will help us build a shared vision for our parks recreations and programs and facilities for the next five to ten years um, as I mentioned, the meeting is next week um, on m Wednesday night in this room at 7 p.m., but there will also be um, hard copy surveys and electronic surveys that will be coming out throughout the spring, and that um, results of all of that and the outcome, will, the final report will be available in September. It's, um, we're looking at a six-month process for that. The, um, the st statistically valid survey will help us predict the trends and patterns and how to address our unmet needs of multi-use spaces indoor and out. Peter did mention our um, the high demand on our fields as well as um, our lack of access to indoor space. And so some of the um, challenges that we're anticipating in the coming years in addition to when there's school construction is we do heavily rely on the access to the schools for our indoor space nights and weekends. Um, with the schools now going to a later start that pushes everything back and we have to be mindful of our children and our students who are now going to be pushed back into the schools to play later which then is a in direct competition with the reason why the school day was starting later so we have to find ways to remain at level service but also be able to expand as our demographics change so as the rise in student population impacts the schools and finding space we also need to find those same space for out of school opportunities and right now we um, are at our limit and are waitlisting many many of our students and adults because of the access for space um, the needs assessment um, will also provide us with the results to give us a strategic action plan that we'll be able to build into our operational budget as well as our capital planning. Um, it will help us with programs and services. It will carve out some uh, plans around how to become financially sustainable as well as how to build this into our capital plan along with all of the other capital needs and competition for the same dollars moving forward. So I did mention our, um, that we are 
self-sustaining and, and trying to be self-sufficient um, with our affordable and accessibility. Um, we did want to um, talk a little bit about some of the um, things that we have been doing to be accessible and affordable. Um, in the last couple of years, we've completely revamped our financial aid program, and we've um, now partnered with the Fund for Lexington, who helps to support, um, I would say, 85% of our financial aid. So we're now providing, between the Enterprise Fund and the Fund for Lexington, over $23,000 in scholarships every year, which prior to two years ago, we were limited to approximately $4,500 a year. So the community impact and the access for families and um, residents who really Need, have a financial need, but also benefit the health benefits and the socialization for participation is really a, a huge community impact that we are continuing to look for funding sources for that. Um, we have also been putting a lot of our efforts into the inclusion and adaptive programming. Peter mentioned um, that we're really excited about um, having the addition of a certified therapeutic rec specialist. This past summer, we're really proud to say, in her capacity, she brought on six part-time summer inclusion staff, and we had over 17 students who joined a typical day camp experience over the summer, which was something that we did not have in place prior to that. That is something that will just continue to grow, and we're partnering with the schools um, from LCP being our new neighbor at the community center, straight through um, the high school with lab. We partner with Neshoba Learning Group as well as the Cotting School for volunteer and employment opportunities. So part of that, um, we also have to invest in our staff with some staff training and staff development so that when we open our doors and we are affordable and accessible that we are prepared to, to support all of our residents who come to join our programs. Um, the capital needs, we are very aware of the competition to the, um, for the same tax dollars. We um, rely on the Recreation Enterprise Fund to support the large majority of what we do at the golf course, and we are um, ever grateful for our support through CPA, which help, really has helped us maintain um, our infrastructure the way we have been able to, um, to maintain safe and healthy uh, facilities for everyone to use and play. And this coming year, we have a few requests that are going to be tax levy requests that are larger than either one of those two funds could support. Some of the, <clears throat> excuse me, programs and services that we're seeing some new trends in that are outside of traditional day camps and sports that you think of when you think of recreation. <laughs> We're seeing the growth of some uh, STEAM and STEM programming. Um, those programs we've been able to accommodate at the community center through um, the spaces there, which has been fantastic and has, it's really wonderful if you come to the community center to see those programs going on in the summer at the same time when we have our typical year-round senior population there during the day to see the interactions just in the hallway. It's um, really uh, amazing to watch. Um, our health and wellness programs have really, um, taken off. I think that <clears throat> in general, when um, traditionally our health and wellness classes, you might have taken an aerobics class or you might have gone swimming at the pool or gone out for a round of golf, but now our health and wellness classes include social, emotional, physical health, and really that well-rounded, how can you remain healthy for your lifespan here in town? So we're looking at different ways around nutrition, how to stay fit even if you're not um, fit to begin with, to, to just get that started, and how to increase your mobility. Um, the therapeutic programs that we've talked about, and believe it or not, our eSports gaming um, drones, the technology is really beginning to impact how we look at how we're doing programs and services and how we can provide the spaces and the tools to stay current, but also to um, be sure that we're meeting the needs of the community. And uh, eSports is something that is blowing up something like pickleball 10 years ago, and uh, it's creeping its way in. So um, we're excited that to be offering some new programs in that area in the coming year. Some of the other demand on facilities, we, we spoke a little bit about our um, access to the gyms and the multi-use spaces. Um, I have to give credit to our staff and to the town. Um, the impact is probably much larger than what we can even um, 
measure. Um, we have some really great places in town where lots of residents are meeting some of their needs, and I think that that should be recognized through Hayden Recreation, Monroe Center for the Arts, some of those community programs that are fulfilling needs that are fantastic so that we can focus on some of the different things that we have. But the, the piece that's the creative part that the staff is doing is that those 50,000 hours on our fields and those 21,000 hours of t tennis and or pickleball um, are putting a stress on, on those facilities as well. So in order to maintain those, it's really becoming difficult because of the wear and tear, because we are actually overtaxing the use of them. So if we actually permitted and used those spaces the way that they're designed to, uh, we'd have a much different um, number and demand on, on our services. So um, it's really kudos to the staff to being creative with the multi-use spaces that we have and as well to facilities in DPW who work so closely with us to make sure that we're able to maintain and keep those facilities open and safe. Um, one of the, the rising trends, and I'm sure that you've all um, experienced this, whether you're in the conservation um, lands or in any of our facilities, is really the increased need for accessible public restrooms through our, our, throughout our park system. Um, an example of that is even at Center Recreation, where we do have public restrooms. The condition of that facility is... Um, beyond failing. Uh, the last time it was renovated was in 1975. So you'll see this year at annual town meeting, we're asking for funds for design and engineering so that with the hopes that the following year we can actually have an improved restroom facility there similar to the Lincoln Park. And um, Lincoln Park and Center Recreation are really our flagship parks in town. And then we have our you know variety of neighborhood and pocket parks throughout the entire town. Um, but those are two facilities where you'll see at Center all of these improvements that have been going in over the last few years and then the restrooms. And it's sort of the way I think about it is when you do a home renovation and you peel the wallpaper off and then you keep peeling and then everything around it starts to look bad that looked good before. And so the restrooms is um, at Center is something we're looking at. The Recreation Committee is very mindful of this and is working with all of our youth sports and adult sports organizations to come up with creative ways to have temporary restrooms at our high-use facilities because the neighborhoods and the parks are starting to feel the impact of not having the restrooms and inappropriate use at, of our parklands. Um, some of the other pieces that we're feeling, the new trends um, throughout town, are the untraditional um, uses of our fields in infrastructure for the, um, when I say untraditional, when you think of the three season sports, you've got football, you've got baseball, you've got softball, you've got soccer. Um, well, now we've got um, ultimate frisbee and we have cricket and we have all of these rising sports that aren't necessarily in our traditional mind of sports at the high school level, but they are growing sports um, in town. And as an example, we have, I would say, close to over 300 participants, youth and adult that are playing cricket in Lexington and so there is a need for, to find them an appropriate space to be able to play that sport where they can develop their skills as well as be in a safe place with the right size fields. There's also um, some interest for an indoor swimming pool. Mm -hmm. There's an interest for dog parks. Um, and so all of these require space, they all require funding, and they all require some attention of um, maintenance. So all of that comes with, with um, you know, some thoughtful thinking, and we're hoping that some of this will, will rise to the top while we continue to go through our community needs assessment, which we hope will complement the comprehensive plan as well as the comp plan comp uh, complement of the community needs assessment. Um, the, the pickleball, I think we've talked about a little bit, and um, that is something that um, we, we have been able to keep up probably a little bit more with our outdoor um, accommodations because we have more hard court surfaces. It's accessible more hours during the day, um, but now those pickleball indoor spaces are in direct competition with traditional uses of an indoor basketball court. So we're really um, trying to do the best we can with the hours and the spaces that we have. Um, so pickleball, cricket, and then active adults. I think the active adults, especially during the daytime and on the weekends, is something that um, we're, we're working really hard to balance uh, with the rising youth uh, use of um, the youth sports and programming as well. 
in addition to uh, our own departments, staff, and the, the commissions and committees that advise us, there are a multitude of other groups in town, nonprofits, um, boards, and uh, various town committees that work really hard to protect all of the resources that we've presented tonight, um, as well as look at the challenges or, or uh, help Lexington prepare to meet the challenges uh, of climate change, global warming. Um, and so we felt the need to uh, acknowledge all those groups. I think a number of you are, are representing the groups that you see up on the screen. There's probably somebody in the audience that represents all these groups <laughs> because many of you wear multiple hats and we really appreciate that. Uh, as we wind down this presentation, we thought it was important to um, just show you the resources that our departments have that are on our websites so that you can learn more about some of the things that we talked about tonight. On the conservation side and on the recreation side, we have the Open Space and Rec Plan from 2015, Principles and Policies for Management of Lexington Conservation Land, which is a guidance document that Mass Audubon helped us create in 2015. There's a plant materials guide for Lexington um, that's an advisory document for um, private residents, but we also use it in town as well to help guide native plant restoration and native planting in Lexington. Um, the Lexington Tree Manual, which um, Karen spoke about, uh, we also have a trail guide and a Lexington Alive field guide and a number of ecological management plans for some of our individual properties. I've mentioned a few of them, Cotton Farm, Wright Farm, the Leary property, which is part of Lower Vinebrook, as well as Willard's Woods, which we're currently working on. So that's on the conservation side. And for recreation, if you go to our website, uh, lexingtonma.gov slash recreation, there's an About Us page. If you click on that, you will see the Open Space and Recreation Plan. You'll also see our 2017 ADA Compliance Study. And we also have a copy of our 2014 through 2016 Strategic Plan. And once again, once the Community Needs Assessment is completed this fall, that will really replace and take us to the next level from the Strategic Plan. So that needs assessment, uh, the results in the Action Plan will be listed on our website as well. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, I, I just want to um, restate uh, the uh, event next Wednesday here in Estabrook Hall. Uh, it, if you go on the website too, you can get more information. LexingtonMA.gov slash LexRecNeeds. That's for the interactive presentation on uh, the short and long-term recreation program and facility needs that Melissa described. I also want to bring your attention before we jump to questions to an April 2nd event that's uh, allied with future thinking related to the comprehensive plan update, uh, the Futures Panel, uh, Challenges and Opportunities for Lexington. That will be in Cary Hall, April 2nd, 7 to 9 p.m. Jake Kaufman will moderate this. And this is uh, going to include a very interesting panel uh, Nariman Baravish uh, is going to present economic trends affecting Lexington's future. Dr. Hackett will present emerging education and technology trends. And Daniel O'Brien, PhD, will present smart cities in his research. Um, he did a massive amount of research on 311 in Boston and what that data means for smart cities and towns of tomorrow. So you'll hear more of that. That's from the Envision Lexington group. Did I get their name right? I hope I did. 2020 committee? I thought they had changed their name. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So you heard a lot about challenges and trends. Um, there's been an incredible amount of accomplishment since the 2003 comprehensive plan and since the 2015 recreation and open space plan. But we, we want to hear from you on what you think are the, the priority concerns, what's missing, and any questions you have for the panel and the, the commission members, Lisa and Rick. And Molly's going to shepherd the mic. Oh, you have a question. Alex and Charlie, would you like to join at the table? <laughs> Uh, 
Hi, thank you for your presentation. I'm not used to speaking into a microphone, so excuse me if I'm awkward. Thanks. I'm not used to speaking into a microphone, so excuse me if I am awkward. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned the Leary parcel several times. I happen to live in the vicinity of the Leary parcel. It was acquired in 2009 and links up to previous non-contiguous parts of the Lower Vinebrook Recreation Area. Um, I have three questions about the Leary parcel. The first question is that in a, I believe it was a 2015 Audubon report, which inventoried the natural resources on the site and presented recommendations for um, improvement and um, maintenance of the site. There were several recommendations, including improved trails on the Leary parcel and invasive species eradication. Um, to the knowledge of the neighbors who use this area quite heavily, none of these recommendations have been implemented. Are there any plans to improve the Leary parcel? Thanks for the question. Um, I can speak a, a little bit to the work that we do an, on an annual basis at Leary Property. Um, and we've heard your concern about um, the recommendations that you've read in the report um, and the lack of any progress on them. On an annual basis, we do garlic mustard pulling and, and what we call annual trail management. Um, the trail connection recommendations that were made in that um, land management plan have been discussed by the commission and the volunteer conservation steward group for a number of years now. The, it's on the project list. It hasn't necessarily risen to the top priority and there's no, there's not necessarily um, a reason for that other than there are a lot of competing priorities. And one important thing is to hear from residents and neighbors like yourself that this is something that's important to you. The benefit of having it in the land management plan, as I said, is that it's it's there. We understand that it's a it's a um, a, a goal and something that's important for the property and for the neighborhood. So I can offer that we've heard your um, your feedback, and it's something that we can look into. We do planning with the conservation commission on a, a semi annual basis, and we're uh, the next time we meet with them to do this type of planning is in May looking at um, opportunities for future fiscal years. So that's certainly something that we can look, look at again um, with a greater urgency. And then, go ahead. I don't wanna cut you off. <laughs> I was just gonna say thank you for your thoughtful response to my first question. May I proceed with my second question? Because sure, I know a lot of other people wanna speak tonight and I don't wanna hog all the time. I, I would say one more thing. The trail recommendations for the Larry property are in some ways more challenging than others because there's a lot of wetland impacts, which means there's gonna be a lot of permitting as well as wetland protection considerations. Um, and that's not the only reason, but that's one reason why we've been hesitant um, simply because it's a more complex project that would require more funding and more expertise. Whereas a lot of the trail projects we do, um, we're able to do the permitting and the construction um, with our volunteer base or with staff expertise. But that particular connection that's mentioned in that report um, is a more complex one. And so we've talked about it a lot and it's certainly something that we wanna do. Um, it just hasn't yet um, been done, but we appreciate your feedback. Can someone pull that on the map for us maybe? It's yeah. um, off Vine Street. Which, yeah. Vine Street is a historic street. Um, it was first established sometime in the mid 1600s and appears on some of the earliest maps of Lexington. It roughly parallels Woburn Street out of the center as you head toward Woburn. My second question about the Leary property is that you have um, expressed enthusiasm for the partnership with LexHab that allowed the purchase of the property. Since acquiring the property in 2009, LexHab has attempted twice to get funding from the town meeting to put affordable housing on the property. When the property was purchased, LexHab and the um, 
Board of Selectmen, as they were called at the time, um, told the local neighborhood that the plan was for one to two affordable housing units on the Leary property, and that was the premise under which the land was purchased and then the LexHab project was tentatively approved. In 2011 and 2013, LexHab attempted to get funds from town meeting um, asking to put six to seven affordable housing units on a seven-tenths of an acre parcel in an area that is zoned single-family residential, that is a one-lane road with no drainage infrastructure next to, as you noted, extremely sensitive wetland environments. Um, they are attempting to do this again in the upcoming Springtown meeting, where they are again asking for funding for the planning and development of seven affordable housing units on that site. While the entire neighborhood is very much in support of affordable housing and was totally on board with the one to two units, we are extremely concerned about the potential impacts on wildlife, wetland resources, viewscapes, recreation, et cetera, on this sensitive area of seven units. Is the Conservation Commission or any of the other parties represented today aware of or partnering with LexHab on this request for funding for seven units at the upcoming town meeting? I can speak very briefly to that, um, that I was not aware. Sorry, um, you are? I'm Alex Doan from the Conservation Commission. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was not aware that they were proposing that significantly higher number of units in that location. Um, that's we were not aware of it either until we read it by combing through the entire um, proposed actions in the, the upcoming town meeting. It was quite buried. So my third question is, how does one integrate affordable housing on a site which you have colored in your maps as conservation? When we're talking about parking lots, we're talking about impervious surface from roofs, we're talking about non-point source pollution, how, how do these two things work together? Um, uh, to speak to that uh, at least a little bit, um, I, I am not familiar, I apologize, with the Leary property plans um, at this point, but uh, in terms of Wright Farm, uh, which I am much more familiar with, we've spent a long time um, figuring out what are appropriate boundaries and how to uh, integrate the two uh, two di very different uses, uh, one being residential and one being open space for uh, public use, um, and thinking carefully about how uh, the public coming and going for the fields and forests of Wright Farm will um, not negatively impact the residents that will be living in the house at Wright Farm, um, which we hope will be uh, open for for um, occupancy this summer, um, and also how the uh, residents who will be living in the home will um, be, uh, what's the word I want? Um, how they will not negatively affect the, the rest of the property. Um, so how to keep them compatible, but, but separate in such close quarters. Thank you for your answer. I'd like to point out that on the Leary property, the historic Civil War era farmhouse that was originally present when the property was purchased and which LexHab proposed as part of the purchase to renovate and use as one of the affordable housing units on the property has since been torn down and demolished by LexHab, a cherished local landmark and much beloved um, old historic structure on the street that many of the neighbors are quite upset about. So we encourage future coordination between those interested in conservation, historic preservation, and affordable housing so that we can all um, meet the goals of all of those organizations. Thank you for letting me speak for so long. I apologize for hogging all the time.
I have a question about safety with um, wildlife management, with coyotes that, that have been spotted in town. <laughs> Is there anyone that deals with that um, issue? And uh, what about for children and pets safety? Thanks for that question. Are you referring to any specific area in Lexington or just in general? No, they may have okay. some crossing. Uh, we live near Lincoln Field and um, some of the websites um, have mentioned spotting um, sure. coyotes. So I can say that in Massachusetts, wildlife is a protected resource on the town level, like on the municipal level with our staff. We don't deal directly with wildlife that exists on conservation land. The state um, division of fisheries and wildlife has a lot of resources on coexisting with coyotes, particularly as it relates to walking on trails and walking with your dogs on trails. To my knowledge in Lexington, there's never been uh, any um, conflict between coyote and human or human and dog. I know that it's a concern because they are wild animals and they're living very close to us. Um, so I can say that we're aware of it when the coyotes are more active, for example, at Willard's Woods, we post signage everywhere, letting people know that the coyotes are more active, that um, it's advisable to stay on the marked trails and keep dogs leashed or at least very close. Dogs should always be under at least voice and sight command, obviously. but. Um, and we have an animal control officer in town, and we work collaboratively with him. His name is Michael Liskowski. And so if there ever were an individual coyote that was thought to be dangerous, um, he would work with the state's Division of Fisheries and Wildlife to either you know, remove or relocate or whatever that individual. But again, to our knowledge, there's not a conflict. It's more of a coexistence, um, something similar to the way we have to live with ticks and poison ivy, where knowing where they are, knowing the risks, but these risks are very manageable and it's, ve it's very safe to, to use our conservation land and use our open space, even if coyotes have their dens and are using it as habitat. So I hope that's a, an acceptable answer to you. I know that a lot of people are worried about it, um, but f as far as we're concerned and, and um, you know, the feedback that we're getting is that they're there, people see them, sometimes they come into people's backyards, and there's a lot of things you can do on your own private property to deter coyotes from coming into your yard and using your yard. Um, but um, at this point, we're just taking the state's guidance and, and working with them on it. Thank you. Sure. Hi, um, so I have a comment and two questions on the rec side. Um, one comment was just the mention of the interest of an indoor pool. I just wanted to let the, everyone know, and you probably surely know this, that the LHS swim team lost their home pool with the, just, you know, the demolition of the um, Miniman High School. So um, unfortunately, my daughter's on the LHS swim team. They could not have a home meet. They could not have, and, and the boys didn't as well. So that's kind of um, just, you know, athletic fields are important, um, but for swimmers, that's their athletic field is the pool. So to have a home pool that they can swim in the winter and in the fall, actually, um, I think is important for the community. So I just wanted to say that. And then my two um, questions were on capacity. Um, we all know community centers not open on Sundays. Has there ever been any discussion about opening it on Sundays that could open up a little bit capacity? And um, on the fields, lighting the fields, we know that Lusk and some other organizations work to light one of the fields at Lincoln. Has there been any discussion, either a partnership, private partnership with the town, and not just you know t taking tax dollars, but somehow doing that again to increase capacity um, on fields when it gets dark? 
Sure, thank you. Um, there certainly is the demand for the community center uh, to be open more hours. Um, we're just going into our fifth year now, and over the course of those five years, we've had some transition with leadership in the department, including myself, as well as the community center director, so as well as the human service director, who um, is overseeing the, uh, the other portions of use in the building. Uh, there certainly is some demand for that. I think we need to build in capacity around staffing. Um, it's not a recreation facility. It's a through department of facilities. So we would really have to build in what that that model would look like to be sustainable through um, all of the other things that would keep it open, whether it's energy, staffing, supplies and equipment, what, what, what programs we would run. Um, just as a reminder, the community center is free to Lexington residents, so it's not something that we ha can generate money to put towards being open, uh, but we can rent it out. There's wait there are revenue sources there to run programming, so, so it definitely is something that I can see happening as we move forward um, in, It'll be interesting to see how that what comes out of the community needs assessment when they find when they look at what facilities are open when and what we have access to. Um, in terms of the lighting of the fields, that is something the recreation committee is is very um, conscious of, especially with the late school start, and um, I, it's something that we are looking at all the time. In fact, one of the articles that are coming forward this year at annual town meeting is uh, requesting funds for an athletic feasibility athletic field feasibility study and that came out as a direct um, result of if you remember two years ago the um, proposed um, intermunicipal agreement with Minuteman uh, that was going to go to town meeting and um, we inevitably didn't bring it forward but that an outcome of that was you know it, rather than investing in a shared property for long-term capital and operations and maintenance what why don't we see what we can do to better invest in our own property so this feasibility study this ask will actually look at all of our fields and see if any of them could be repurposed or realigned to maximize their use. So there may be that the diamond is in one corner and if it was put in a different corner, we'd gain more multi-use space in the outfield. They'll give us feedback on if this field is a good choice for lights or it's a good choice for lights, but these are the things to consider the neighborhood impact, the conservation impact, all of those things. And then I think the Recreation Committee is very, um, being very thoughtful about what the tolerance in town is for putting lights on the fields um, to meet these needs as well as what that means to a neighborhood because some of our um, parks that are used are are in pocket parks and they're in people's backyards versus fields that are a little bit more um, I would say outside of a dense neighborhood. Um, I will say that the center track and field renovation project, which um, as long as the weather cooperates this spring, um, will open in mid-May and that the track and field will have athletic lights. So that will be a new addition since the um, Lincoln lights. So th those will be two fields that will be uh, newly lit. And um, just one more thing on the lights at uh, the center track, we're really excited that right now the fields um, when they're permitted, the lights come on. When the tennis courts are permitted, the lights come on. The lighting system at the track will actually have lighting um, for the, the track only. So if the in, internal field is not permitted, we'll still be able to illuminate the track so that the public can use that beyond dark, which is going to be a huge addition to the community. If you ever go by there at any time, the track always has someone walking on it. So thank you. I just I just want to ask about um, fallen wood. We have uh, obviously a, a great desire to sequester as much carbon as we can, but uh, the last few years we've had weird weather, so we've had heavy rains. And at least in in my neighborhood park, the the clay soil um, is comes to within about six inches of the top of the ground, and so trees have they don't have root balls; they have root planes. And they get knocked over when the when they're in wet soil and the wind blows hard. Uh, I worry that if we have a prolonged drought, we have a tremendous amount of fuel lying around on the ground throughout Lexington. And I don't know that there's any understanding of that or any plan to deal with that. But it's it's an interesting uh, concern of mine. 
Um, we haven't had, to the best of my knowledge, uh, brush fires in Lexington, but I think the risk is only increasing with that. Um, it's tough because if you want to remove the wood, you're removing the sequestered carbon. At the same time, if it gets removed by fire, it turns into carbon dioxide. So, um, and then the other thing is just the general um, overgrowth and, and eutrophication of wetlands. Um, what was at the base of my neighborhood, uh, a, s a swampy area, I guess you'd call it, but there had been a stream flowing through there. At one point, my children and I were walking and found a wooden boat. And um, there's no way that you could imagine a boat in that wetland now. So that wetland clearly over the 30 years we've lived here has continued to fill in to the point where the park that it surrounds is routinely flooded instead of being dry. And I don't know if there's any plan or if there are rules against doing anything about that. Is that considered a natural process that we can't address? Or are, can we manage wetlands in a way that involves actually doing something to try to restore them? Thanks. I can, I can speak to the, um, what I think you were referring to as the fire hazard associated with higher fuel loads from not doing kind of uh, intervention burns. And I'll let other people on this panel speak to the carbon sequestration and the kind of wetland protection. Um, that is something that I agree, I think we need to look at. We're doing land management planning at Willard's Woods right now, and we've hired a company that um, has uh, ecologists on their staff. And one is a forester, and he's been asked, we've asked him to look at uh, the woods at Willard's, the woods at Willard's Woods, the forest at Willard's Woods from a number of different angles, one being um, the accumulation of um, fuel, I guess. Now, whether or not even if there was a recommendation to do some type of controlled burn, we would be able to do that safely um, at Willard's Woods. I'm not. Yeah, I, I'm not proposing we start lighting fires. That's not what I'm thinking. Um, there, there, there is a, a miraculous device known as a chainsaw, <laughs> and followed by a splitting wedge, can be used by folks to harvest firewood. And I'm not suggesting that I approve of that either. But there are lots of ways of removing this stuff without burning it. Uh, I simply wonder if we have any plan to remove it. I don't want to start okay. fires. So then simply put, you've asked a simple question, so I'll give you the simple answer. There's no plan to remove wood other than stuff that might come down on a trail that's accessible to a road, and there's an interest from the people that are doing the work. I work with a lot of stewards, and occasionally we might be close enough to a road to buck up the wood for firewood, but in general we leave stuff um, where it lays. There's some amount of coarse woody debris that you need for wildlife habitat and to act as nurse logs for regeneration, but, and I take your point. And again, it is something that we're looking at at Willard's Woods, whether there is, let's say, too much or what the right amount is, but it's not something, to my knowledge, that we're actively looking at removing downed wood on town land for, for that purpose. Um, and I'll let other, other folks speak to the carbon sequestration and the, the wetland question you had. So in regards to your wetlands question, um, so wetlands are dynamic and changing all the time. So they do um, not stay constant. So they do grow and expand depending on conditions, development, other things like that. But, um, and then also with the Wetlands Protection Act, it does um, require um, permitting and such for activities within wetlands. Um, it does um, prevent alteration of wetlands but it doesn't preclude ecological restoration of wetlands. So um, we have been partnering with engineering um, regarding ecological restoration, specifically stream restoration projects in town. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar, but for instance, um, at Willard's Woods, uh, engineering um, helped us develop plans and implement a daylighting of a stream project. Um, and then also at Whipple Hill, um, the same thing, removing culverts and restoring the banks of um, Reed's Brook. So there, there is an opportunity if you we're looking at it as an ecological restoration type project, um, not a removal of wetlands, but more enhancing it for flood control and other um, native plant species and such. Those are 
wildlife habitat. Those are probably activities that the conservation would review and most likely permit approval if it's ecological restoration. And in terms of carbon sequestration, I don't have much to add. We are interested in carbon sequestration. Um, uh, and we're beginning to look at um, how to factor that into sort of how we go about managing our conservation lands. Obviously, what we do here in Lexington isn't going to do much to affect carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, but everyone clearly needs to do what they can, and, and we want to certainly model best practices. So we're interested. We're looking into it. I don't have a, a short answer for you. I have a question, and I probably should know the answer, but does conservation have any jurisdiction at all over stone walls if they're not actually running through conservation land? And the reason I ask is that we're losing a lot. Because there's so much development going on, the walls kind of get in the way. But these are 200-year-old placements of rocks that add a certain amount of history and beauty and context to Lexington. And as far as I can tell, there's no regulation. We regulate our trees, but we don't regulate our walls. And if you know anything about the state regulation of stone walls, I think the fine for removing a stone wall is $10, something like that. Um, so is there anything? And if not, could there be something? Uh, great question. Um, I love our rock walls. Um, to my knowledge, there is no current regulation. Other, um, I think it would be a great idea to put something in there. I know these parcels that do end up getting developed, they tend to just bulldoze the rocks away. Um, and I think if we could have a bylaw that would preserve those, that would be great. Um, I don't think it falls specifically under conservation jurisdiction, um, as you said, unless it's on conservation land. But um, if someone were to sue to propose a bylaw, I think the Conservation Commission might support it. <laughs> um, my name is Jean Williams, and I'm here because I'm. I guess I would call myself a plant person. I'm mainly interested in conservation land in terms of the plants and the wildlife that's on it. Um, and I'm one of my concerns in Lexington is that we have set aside a great deal of land and open space, but we're not paying enough attention to the plants because a lot of our conservation land, unfortunately, might as well be paved because it's so invaded with non-native plants that the native plants are being completely squeezed out. Um, and part of the problem, I think, is that we have so much fragmentation of this land in terms of who's in charge of it that we have conservation stewards working in some areas, and of course we never have enough volunteers, but that's a separate problem. But there's a lot of conservation land that doesn't, I mean open space, that doesn't fall under conservation. So nobody is really paying attention to, to what kinds of plants are growing there. And of course plants don't know where the boundaries are and they're spreading all over town. The first time I walked through the cotton farm property when it was first acquired by the town, besides the trees themselves, I couldn't see anything there that was a native plant. Um, I'm sure that's a, an exaggeration, but the amount of invasives on some of our conservation land is, is just stunning. And to my mind, if we don't deal with that now, in a in a really vigorous way, uh, what's the point of conserving all this land? It's it might as well be pavement. Uh. <laughs> well, no, uh, um, I I think that what you've brought up 
speaks to one of the many challenges of the conservation department um, in terms of um, time and money, basically, uh, which comes down to staff. Um, we all see the problem, and as I'm sure you know, you know, you can clear the invasives from spot X, but if spot Y next door isn't cleared, they're going to come back. Um, it's a huge project, and I think that the conservation department views it as a um, an intellectual priority, but not one that there's um, staff or funds to work with, unfortunately, at this point. Uh, maybe you have more to say. Targeted. It, right now, the approach is targeted. So, for instance, <laughs> we, we just worked on the cotton farm property, and a large part of that was doing some restoration work. Um, I know Jordan at Joyce Miller has done a large um, invasive species and restoration. So it, it's targeted at this point, um, just trying, trying to work on it in a targeted approach. Um, it, it would be very difficult to try to do a town-wide invasive species. I think most approach by land organizations is to do a target approach um, because of the complexity and the expansive amount of invasive species in communities. I'm, I'm not going to add anything. I just wanted to acknowledge that Jean Williams, who just asked the question, for several years uh, on her own initiative installed an interpretive invasive plant trail at uh, Lincoln Park um, to help the community identify um, and uh, invasive plants and then encourage them to – encourage people to try and manage them on their own properties. And uh, I don't, I don't know how successful it was, but I, but I, I think that the con on the, we have the conservation commission and certainly staff. We greatly appreciate the effort, and it's a, it's a great question and a great challenge. And I, it's a priority of our department, and certainly we look to the community and people like Eugene to help us to figure out how we do um, meet this challenge. Um, hi, I want to thank you. Um, it's been really wonderful, I think, hearing, and I, 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 and uh, it's wonderful, actually, your last comment. I'm going to dovetail into that because I think there is, it wasn't sort of up on the screen up front and center, but uh, some of, there's a massive amount of privately owned open space in town that's just backyards, frankly, and uh, as we head into this time of real concern about climate change and uh, water quality and, and all those things, I think there is a big opportunity given the connections between the experts in our town on the Conservation Commission, on the Recreation uh, Committee, in the uh, engineering and everything else to connect to the community and uh, really educate them. And I wish I'd known about that invasive plant trail because to me, I, I don't know how I can look on the web all I want, but unless I'm actually out in the field, I, I don't know what that looks like. <laughs> uh, nor do I know how to create in my yard very effectively uh, a place of carbon sequestration or uh, what my options might be. It's so easy to have the pa Redding paving come and repave my driveway, but there are other options for my driveway. So I, I just think there's a big education opportunity and the vehicle's right there in the community center where you have so much com of our community going through and, and that partnership. Just a comment. Uh, I, and thank you all uh, very much. Hi, I'm from uh, Lexington Community Farm, and I just want to point out an omission on the second to last slide that Jordan put up about other stakeholders in the town that have open space and care about open space. Um, I don't think Lex Farm was listed on there, unless I missed it. Um, we have um, five acres of, of um, property that's in um, agriculture. And there's it's a seven and a half acre property overall. A lot of it is buildings and roads. Um, 
The other thing I want to point out is that we had a very successful uh, relationship with LexHab, who have just put in uh, six housing units in two buildings on a half acre of that Busa property that was bought by the town with CPA funds. And we uh, worked with them on some of the issues that we have with, you know, having a property adjacent to an organic farm. There's rules and regulations that we have to follow and our, our butters have to follow. And they were really good about accommodating us. So um, we're really happy with that. And the other thing is um, Lexington Community Farm is really looking forward to uh, the opportunity in the future to work with um, Lexington Conservation, possibly um, putting some of their acreage into agriculture, um, similar to Dennis Busa is doing now on Waltham Street. Um, and also with recreation to find a way to do some joint programming. We have a unique uh, space. We don't have a lot of facilities, but we do have a unique space and would be more than happy to uh, find a way to have a partnership. We're not in it for the money. We just wanna have people enjoy the farm and and you know have a learning experience there thank you you were talking about the um open space purchases from the last decade or or maybe 15 years has anyone tracked the loss of open space to private development during that time and how that compares to the town acquisitions that's a good question, and um, I, I'm not aware, but I would have to maybe check in with the planning department to see if they've done any type of build-out analysis with, since the last comprehensive plan or thing. So we can we can definitely add that to our list and check in on And that. And a similar question around the, the people are talking about carbon sequestration, um, uh, keeping the trees up, uh, the healthy trees in our yards um, is you know sort of number one on the list, but I, and I'm not sure what kind of loss of tree canopy the town has had also over that same period. I'd be interested in learning that. But um, my main question is, you you discussed the what seem to be dwindling opportunities for open space purchases because you're competing with private developers, um, and I'm curious about uh, any opportunities you see on the horizon um, or if you're looking for help from um, people in town to determine if there are some spaces that you might be able to get before they get in uh, private development hands? Yeah, so um, in back in the mid 90s, uh, uh, the Land Acquisition Subcommittee of the Conservation Commission, which Alex and I both serve on, um, under the leadership of David Williams, did a, um, prepared a, um, a study of lands of conservation interest around town. And efforts were made to reach out to those landowners and, and to track them. Um, and we've been more or less successful or not successful with that over time. But um, uh, I will say we are, we continue to talk to certain landowners that have expressed interest in working with us either through um, purchase or um, donation, uh, and I think um, we've talked about um, this spring, um, revisiting that plan once again and updating it, reaching out to landowners, um, and, and bringing our work up to date. Thank you very much. I'm gonna change the subject back to recreation and just, I realize that you both seem new enough that you may not know the answer to this, but I think we knew that the Minuteman Technical School was going to be demolished, and with it, the indoor pool, and we spent money on our community pool. Why didn't we consider the possibility of, of the sort of temporary enclosure that you sometimes see that gets put over things in the winter and then taken off in the summer? Did Was that ever considered, or do you know? Well, there's, there's an inflatable structure that you can see in some places that's placed over tennis courts or other kinds of indoor facilities. And it, it just struck me that the provision for such a thing could have been incorporated uh, in the pool renovation work, but it wasn't. And I just wondered why that wasn't done. Sure. So um, 
in the strategic plan from 14, 2014 to 16 and any of the needs assessment surveys that the department has done um, in through the rec committee communications, there's only been once or twice in the last 10 years that an interest of an indoor pool had come before the recreation committee. This was really a, a relationship between Minuteman and the school department. Um, so the urgency for access to an indoor pool came to the recreation committee um, I would say we were probably 80% complete with our outdoor pool. But at that time, uh, we did bring in the facilities department to look at what possibilities would be there um, for temporary or extended access because we open um, usually the first Saturday of June and stay open till Labor Day. So we were just looking at even extended access because the high school does use the pool for captain's practices in August they do access that to have some outdoor um, pool. And in fact, the, the space and the infrastructure wouldn't have been able to hold, I guess, is, I'm probably not the right word, but wouldn't be able to accommodate one of those bubbles because of what it needed for the infrastructure to hold it up, the air quality, the circulation. There was a lot more than, it sounds easy to just sort of put a bubble over it, but the, it just, the, the site didn't have the infrastructure for it, for the, um, the cover, but it also did not have the infrastructure to accommodate even a home meet with our facilities um, in terms of the building itself. So we did work um, closely with facilities to try to make something happen even as a small relief, but it just was not something that was possible. If it was something even to look at to, because one idea was to, um, to change the outdoor pool to an indoor pool, it would have just been a complete um, removal of what's there and building another pool. It would, the, just because of the infrastructure of the piping and all of that, you know, it's a winterized, it's not anything that would have been able to been repurposed for winter use. It's, it's wonderful to live in a town with the kind of, uh, open space that we have and with the recreational assets that we have. And I'd like to thank all of you for all your efforts in helping to acquire and, and manage those, those assets first. Uh, I think part of it in, in the town is that we have the, the 1,300 acres of conservation land, but people have mentioned there's a lot of other open space that's not part of that conservation land. And, and I, I bet many people take it for granted I don't. I think much of it is probably endangered as open space, and I, I want to continue to. Uh, I'm going to urge you to continue aggressive efforts to try to acquire open space for conservation purposes or other purposes for the town. And I know it's it's much more difficult now because of the price of property, and it's and it's not going to be at the level that it was once upon a time in terms of acreage. But I think it those efforts should still continue as vigorously as possible. The second thing I want to say is that I appreciate all the efforts of the tree committee to try to do tree planting, but I, I walk around town a lot. There's a lot of street trees that are either gone or in poor shape, and there's a huge amount of work that could be done. To, I mean, there, there's streets like Worthen Road that have tiny little trees on them and should have big trees. There's just in places where the plantings are inappropriate and need to be done, done better. Then I want to make two other points, which is if this is really was, uh, I think, put together as a planning exercise or to gather input for planning. And one of the things I just want to note is that when the property on Pelham Road was purchased, that's now where Lexington Place is, the, the Board of Selectmen at the time voted to, to acquire it for both municipal and school purposes, and the municipal purpose was to enhance the community center at some point. And that sort of fell by the wayside, I hope temporarily. So I hope that planning additional gym and other space for the community center will continue to be part of the planning uh, as, as things go forward with, with the planning especially with the big success of the community center, I'm sure it could use better facilities. 
And finally, I just want to say that you, you mentioned how when the schools, when there's school construction, it ends up being a temporary problem because the school field goes out of service for a while. We're, gonna, we're likely going to have that problem in spades when the, if, the, if the high school gets replaced. And we don't know when that's going to be. It might be in three years. It might be in five years. It might be in ten years. But the high school is surrounded by a lot of wet areas. And there's not, there, is, there are some parking lots and things where you could imagine starting to build a new high school if that's how it's going to go. We don't really know how it's going to go. But if that's not where it goes, it could end up being put on, one of the, on those athletic fields that are next door. Because I think at least if you look on the town assessor's website at the, at the um, online records, there's 56 acres, which is all part of the high school. Most of the, and that includes the, the center track, the, the softball fields, the football field, the tennis courts, all of that. Uh, so you, I don't know if there's a reasonable way to anticipate what's going to happen in the planning process. It's probably impossible because it's such a, comp, such a complicated problem. But I think when you're really engaging in a comprehensive plan, you, you, ha, you ought to think about that a bit. But thanks. Are there any other questions or comments? We want to thank you all very much for, your, for coming out tonight and for your thoughtful input and comments. They've been recorded and they'll be incorporated into the trends summary and the, and the plan. Thanks so much. And thanks to our panel. Wow. Really.